Hello everyone, this is Jotto and welcome to the Mana Grind Tournament Recap. Talking about the top decks, talking about the top cards. And State of the Metagame, which is on an article which goes up on Friday, so keep tuned for that. It goes up on uh, hearthbone.com on the front page on Friday. So if you want to sort of tune in for my little State of the Metagame thing, a bit more in-depth analysis on a certain deck that I found very, very interesting, go over there on Friday, go ahead and read it. Anyway, moving on to another top three from NA. We keep missing one deck from NA. We missed it last week, missed it this week, a little awkward. Anyway, in first place we had Rosen Vloggen. Amazing name. Second place, Ray KK. And in third place, Con... Con QI. Con... Con Q? Con... It's a Q without a U after it. How do you pronounce that? Whatever. Anyway, moving on. Rosen Flogum was playing Shaman Midrange OTK. Now, before we go over the deck, Shaman is a very, very good matchup for a certain deck that has won two tournaments in a row, which was Warlock Watchers. This is very, very good against that deck because you have Hexes. So naturally, Shaman won both tournaments because it's very, very good for this weekend. Not sure if it's going to keep being dominant, but for this weekend, definitely very, very powerful, especially against those Warlock decks. Moving on to the actual deck. First of all, core of the deck, we have Blood Mage Thanos with, along with Azurdrick and Gadgetan Auctioneer to sort of set up your draw power through the early and mid game. Then we have Karen to hold down the mid game as he's a 4-5, very difficult to answer, especially with Tink Master being out of the format now. Then we have an Unbound Elemental to really put pressure on early in the game along with some Fury Protector. And Flame Tongue Totems to make all of your totems useful. It's also an outlet for your OTK win condition, which in this case is Alakir the Windlord. Onto the actual spells, we have two Feral Spirits to hold down aggro. Lightning Storm is just big burst. Particularly efficient against aggro, but can also have some use against midrange. Earth Shocks, Basic Silence, very, very important. Lightning Bolts, because you can't use Rock Biters for damage in this, you need the Lightning Bolts. Hex deals with anything large, it's why it's good against its specific targeted deck, because it doesn't have to run big game hunters to deal with giants. Lastly, we have two Stormforge Axes for early game control and also a little bit of burn if you think about it. You can just attack them repeatedly. Now, I skipped over the Rock Powder Weapon there, and Rock Powder Weapon is not used as removal 90% of the time, unless absolutely necessary. It's used along with Flame Tongue Totems to give Alakir large amounts of attack so you can swing in for 12 or 16 damage out of nowhere and just win the game on his own. This deck is playing the least explosive variant of this. It's not playing Leor Jenkins, for example, which can do 18 in one turn with Wind Fury. However, it's more reliable when you actually have the Alakir. You probably have an outlet to actually kill them. So, very, very powerful deck. Very good against the current field. Speaking of the current field, onto Ray KK playing Warlock Watchers. This deck has been very, very powerful recently. It's shown that it has got much, much stronger with the, the leaving of Tink Master. Onto the actual deck, we have Karen Bloodhoof to hold down the mid game. Lord Draxus and Ragnar show up as big late game bombs in a deck that already has a lot of late game bombs. Without Faceless Manipulator, since there's so many targets in this deck to just make an 8 8 or make Ragnaros, just it's crazy. You can even make an Ancient Watcher if you really, really need to. And then lastly, for the legendaries, we have Leroy Jenkins to give the deck a little bit of extra reach. Moving on to sort of the, the rest of the deck before we go into the main section of the deck. We have two Other Ring Farseals to heal yourself up through life taps, two Iron Bicals, cheap silence. If you're life tapping, Iron Bical life tap is usually better than Spellbreaker, so it's just better to run the Iron Bical in this situation. For the spells, we have Shadow Flame since you are playing some really, really large stuff. Siphon Soul to deal with all of those things you just can't deal with efficiently. Helps a lot in the mirror match as well. One Power Foaming for Reach Mortal Coils to control some of the early stuff, especially Harvest Golems. Soul Fires, they discard your own stuff, and quite frankly, that hurts a lot in this deck because it's high priority stuff that's being discarded. But it's such a powerful spell being 4 for 0 cost, it just is really hard to miss. Then we have. Lastly, for the spells, a one-off Hellfire to complement the Shadow Flames as a board wipe without a minion involved. Onto the actual core of the deck and where it really gets its name from, we have a full Shields Up Engine, four Giants, Ancient Watcher, Twilight Drake, some Fear Protector, and one Defender of Argus. Now, what this aims to do is essentially stall the game early with Twilight Drakes, and Ancient Watchers are putting on a little bit of pressure with Twilight Drakes while giving them Taunt with some Fury Protection Defenders. Then late game, you win out with your Giants with Taunt, and they just can't get through, and you beat their face in. 
And then if you need a little bit of extra help, you have the Ragnaros, Lord Jaraxxus, Leroy Jenkins. A very, very powerful deck. It's been doing very, very well in the open tournaments recently. On to the obligatory Warrior Legendaries deck. And what do I mean by this? There's always one. Never two. I, don't, I actually can't remember the last tournament. There were two in there. It, like two, I'm talking about both top fours. Like not, not even on one top four. I don't remember the last time there were two of these decks. That's weird. Anyway, I, I'm for anyone who's been keeping sure you pretty much you probably know this deck list by heart by now because it's pretty universal. You get a couple of texts here or there, but it's more or less universal with the exception of the win conditions. Anyway, on the actual deck, first of all we have an early enrage engine in armor smiths, along with frothing berserkers, acolyte of pains, and cruel taskmasters. Acolyte of Pain and Armorsmith help set up for your mid to late game. Frothing Berserker provides a threat they have to answer early and often or they will die. You have a Gadget and Auctioneer to benefit off all your cheap spells with Defender of Argus to buff up some of your win conditions and also some of your Enrage Engine targets. Onto the spells, we have one Brawl for Board Wipe. Then we have Shield Slams along with Shield Blocks to deal large amounts of damage out of nowhere to minions. Shield Block also cycles and sort of functions as a healing spell. We then have one in a rage to aid the cruel taskmasters in the enraging of your things like Frothing Berserker and Armsmiths and Acolyte Pains. You can cycle your inner rage on Acolyte, draw a card, you now have a 3 2 Acolyte that will probably cycle as well and draw another card. On the rest of the spells, we have Slam, which will usually cycle, it can cycle twice even with a Gadget Sound Auctioneer on the board. Whirlwind to buff up all your stuff while killing some of his stuff, and Execute because it synergizes really, really well with all these enrage outlets. Lastly, onto the weapons, we have two fiery war axes for early game control and burn, and then one gore howl as removal. Normally, this synergizes with Alexstrasza win condition, but there really isn't an Alexstrasza win condition. I mean, it can be used as a win condition at seven damage to the face, but there's no Alexstrasza in this deck, so you can't really use it as that kind of one shot combo thing. So this is purely from late game minion removal. Onto the actual minions, the really really big stuff. Now, we've already been through all the small stuff, the enrages. The difference between these lists is the win conditions. And that's generally the difference between a deck that doesn't do too well and a deck that makes top four. And that's usually why there's only one, because that legendary selection matters so much depending on the weekend. So, we have Karen Bloodhoof. Again, less hard removal. Going to be a little bit weaker when shamans show up a bit more, but then maybe you want to bait the hexes on your Karens. We then have Grom Hellscream, he just dodges everything and can even kill a giant straight out if he has an inner rage buff on him. Ragnaros, again, kills giants, also wins the game very, very quickly. Those two are pretty much universal in every single deck. Now the last one, most people put Alex Straza here, but there's a lot of big game hunters running around, so you just jam the Azera. The Azera will live for probably two, three, four turns because of the lack of Tank Master. It's only going to get hexed in this current format, so it's essentially a win condition. If they don't silence it, you're going to be drawing an extra card every single turn, and those cards are powerful. Zera, premium, premium win condition at the moment, with so many big game hunters running around to counter all the giants. Moving on to top 4 from EU, we had in first place Trash T1, second place Saluzo, and tied for third we had Mana Grinds Timbolt, and Itball. On to Trash T1, who's playing a Shaman midrange deck. Now, because these are pretty close to duplicates, I'm not going to go over the majority of the deck. I'm just going to go over the slight, slight changes in this particular version. So the slight changes in this one is that we have two Fork Lightning as just a little bit of extra control that a lot of decks haven't really been running, but you have two Unbound Elementals, and you need to make up for the lack of Stormforge Axe on the Overload count a little bit. We then have a Yazera as a late game win condition, as opposed to an Alakir. Much more consistent, but less bursty. And then we have Big Game Hunter to counter some of these Warlock decks, along with an Earth Elemental. Bit of Big Game Hunter bait, but there's no other Big Game Hunter targets in the entire deck. So he might sort of save it for Ragnaros or something, and then the Earth Elemental gets value. You never know, it also is an extra unbound elemental trigger that you get out of the deck. Besides that though, the deck is pretty similar. We also have two Lava Bursts to deal with Yetis primarily. Chillwind Yeti, very, very irritating. Lava Burst, it, it's dead. But besides that, pretty much the same. Moving on to... I can't believe that Rexar showed up on a slide. It's a Hunter midrange deck. The world is ending. 
Yep, Saluzo managed to get second with a hunter, not just any hunter midrange deck. You think, oh, oh, this is like the rush you down. That no, no, this is beast midrange. Okay. So, what did he put in this deck? That I think is the universal question that everyone wants to know in this situation. Because I don't recall the last time Hunter has been in a top four. I don't even remember. Like normally you say, "Oh, it was a couple months ago," but no, I actually don't remember the last time. I think it may have been back when old OTK was a thing. I mean, the Unleash the Hounds giving all your beasts plus one attack and charge. I think that was the last time it made a top four. That was five months ago? That was a long time ago. Really weird to see a Hunter deck make it this far. I was very, very surprised. Definitely going to be the one I do the article on, by the way. On That's coming out on Friday. I'm definitely going to be doing this deck on the article because I... I was shocked to be to be frank when putting it when putting this in in the actual side. I did not expect this to ever get here. So what is in this miraculous deck? Starting with the minions, we have an Emperor Cobra, already a card that no one plays. This is the interesting thing about this hunter deck. It managed to make all these really really weird beasts work. Now Emperor Cobra is a beast, so it is a trigger for your kill commands and. That's sem that's semi important. You can also put a Hound Master buff on it, which is very important. But it's a two three that kills anything. And if you have a Tundra Rhino, it is just three mana kill thing. Very good against giants. Moving on to Savannah High Main, arguably the strongest six drop. Fire Elemental is very very powerful, but Fire Elemental I think is stronger than Savannah High Main because of the decks it's in, not because Savannah High Main is weaker. Savannah High Main's effect is completely ridiculous. It's a 6-5, same stats, Fire Elemental. Instead of 3 damage, you get 2 two twos. Pretty crazy. Especially with lack of Tink Monster, you can't just Tink Monster to get rid of the effect anymore. You have to hex it. Very, very powerful threat. Then have Stampede and Kodo. Main target, Harvest Golems and Flame Tongue Totems. Jungle Panther. Helps trade with pretty much anything from turn 3 or 4. It kills Azure Drake on Gadget Town very, very easily. Can't even deal with it because I still have to AoE the board. Scavenging Hyena works very, very well with Unleash the Hounds and also some of the lower drop beasts in this deck. Makes a huge Hyena. Again, has to be hexed. Then we have Starving Buzzard. Again, Unleash the Hounds, that's your draw engine. You can also use it behind Taunt to avoid some of the Druid Hero powers and Rogue Hero powers. Tundra Rhino gives charge to everything. Now, Tundra Rhino is very, very expensive, but he's a 2 5 with charge. Which, I mean, Stormwind. Storm Knight is a 4-drop that does that kind of thing. But for 1 extra mana, all your other stuff gets charged as well. Or more or less all your other stuff. Now, Tundra Rhino into Savannah High Main is terrifying. Because the Savannah High Main, especially if you're going second, because you go Tundra Rhino, and then they go Fire Elemental or something, pick off something else. And then you go Savannah High Main, kill the Fire Elemental, get two twos, two two twos, and then attack him for 4. Like, Savannah High Main's interaction with uh, Tundra Rhino is completely ridiculous. <laughs> it is completely absurd because it spawns beasts and they all get charged. So the other one is uh, Scavenging Hyena with Unleash the Hounds. You just get a massive Scavenging Hyena with charge. Really, really interesting interactions that makes all of your top decks deadly. We then have two Bloodfen Raptors. It's two drop. Once a two drop, that was solid besides his Scavenging Hyenas because Starving Buzzard is not really a two drop. It's sort of an attachment to late game play. Bloodfin Raptor, solid 2 drop, it's a beast that enables your kill commands. Then have Hound Monster, makes all your beasts insane. Put this on a Bloodfin Raptor, you now have a 5 4 with Taunt. If you're going second, you can get that on turn 3, that's pretty insane. Emperor Cobra, I think, is the best one to put this on. You end up with a 4 5 where anything that attacks it, and as Taunt, anything that attacks it dies. If it doesn't have Divine Shield. So it is a very, very interesting card. Normally, Hound Monster isn't played because you need a really high density of beasts in your deck, but this deck has a very, very high density. Lastly, for the minions, as far as the beasts go, we have a one of Timberwolf. Not too good, because it's not a rush deck, but you can still get some value out of it, and that's why it's here. But lastly, for the actual minions, we have two Sentients. Now, this is a weird one to have two Sentient in here, but if you think about it, you want to go Sentient Tundra Rhino, and you want to have a turn to set up your Tundra Rhino for your plays on turn six. 
So having Ascension is actually not the worst thing ever. You can curve also Eagle Horn Bow Trap. That's another thing you can curve into Ascension, and it just stalls the board long enough for you to set up plays. It's also a decent body on the ground, and it stalls Chillwind Yetis. You have Kill Command for Chillwind Yeti as well, but it stalls Chillwind Yetis until you actually get an answer for it, which is a very, very interesting interaction with this kind of deck type. Now, we do have one Eagle Horn Bow in this deck. Only one, because there are very, very stingy traps in this particular deck. We have one Explosive Trap for Board Wipe, one snipe to just pick off something they're playing. Novice Engineer, Loot Hoarder, not a problem anymore. The worst thing this can hit in the format is probably Blood Mage, I should imagine. Then we have two Unleash the Hounds. Just punish your opponent for doing anything like that. And it's also a pseudo-explosive trap with some extra synergies here or there. Then of Animal Companion, the best three-drop beast in the game most of the time. Pretty much all the options are good. I think that Huffer is probably the worst one in this deck. But that's oh, depending on situation. I think Misha's the strongest as usual. Leok has a lot of uses in this particular deck. And Huffer, unless you need to kill something, is the weakest one here. Because you don't really depend on the 4 damage straight out the gate. But Animal Companion, very, very powerful. Then have a Hunter's Mark. Do pretty much anything along with Unleash the Hounds. will just kill anything. Two kill commands. So many beasts. It just becomes 3 mana. Lava Burst with no drawback. Which is completely crazy. One multi-shot. Pseudo AoE helps deal with aggro decks. Then we have a tracking to dig for those answers when you need them. Very, very interesting deck. Hope to see more of it. On to Tim Bolt, playing a Shaman midrange OTK deck. Again, I will not go on too much about this deck because we've seen it pseudo twice already. Um, this particular version had two mana tide totems for draw. In, in Two mana tides instead of the gadget sands. Had two Azures and it had two Azures as well, but it had two Mana Tides because it's playing less spells, so it's more efficient than Gadgetan. But then had one Chillwind Yeti as well to hold down the mid game, and an Argent Commander as a little bit of extra burst, bit of extra damage out of nowhere. You can put a Rock Biter on him; it's still seven damage. It's a decent chunk. But besides that, deck more or less the same. One Lightning Storm is interesting though. I am curious to see sort of how that one Lightning Storm played compared to two, and whether it was enough. On to our last deck, we have Ippo playing Warlock Zoo. Now, Zoo is about as aggro as is humanly possible, playing four spells, two soul fires, because you're life tapping all the time, so the soul fire is much of a drawback. The worst thing a soul fire can discard in this deck is probably an Archon Commander or another soul fire. We then have two mortal cards to deal with Harvest Golems efficiently. Besides that, just all, all rush. Starting with Archon Commander, which is the big thing in this deck, along with Doom Guard. Massive power late game, lets you close out the game quickly. Defender of Argus also buffs up all of your small stuff, which is very, very relevant in this kind of deck. Zoo is a very, very buff focused version of the standard aggro deck. The Knife Juggler to synergize off all your small drops, make them live, make them do a bunch of damage. Young Priestess buffs up all your important threats like Knife Juggler. Ar and Argent Squire, amazing one drop in this particular deck. So many buffs that you can put on this thing. Dire Wolf Alpha, Defender of Argus. Shadowed Sun Cleric. These are huge things you can put on Argent Squire and it's just really annoying to deal with. Speaking of Dire Wolf Alpha, here is kind of a Timberwolf for this kind of deck where it just makes all of your stuff powerful and that's all it has to do. You can also stack damage with it. You can put it in the middle, attack, sacrifice that into something and then the other one will move over and get the attack boost and you can keep doing that. You do it with Flame Tongue Totem as well. Then we have Flame Imp, sort of the other really, really core one drop. Harvest Golem, Scarlet Crusader, essentially four copies of Harvest Golem. Scarlet Crusader is more aggressive, but less efficient, so it's just good to run both. Then I have Shield Bearer. Now, Shield Bearer is not a dead card in this deck, because it protects all of your important threats, like Knife Juggler, and you can also buff it to be useful. Shadowed Song Cleric, not as powerful as it used to be as a 3-3, but as a 3-2, still plenty good in this kind of deck, especially if you target things like Knife Juggler, Argent Squire, Dire Wolf Alpha, Defender of Argus, important targets you need to... Defender of Argus, not so much, but it does make the body useful. That's the point. Makes him into a 3-4, which is much, much more scary than a 2-3. And you already got value out of your defender, so you're just getting two for ones at that point, basically. The other major target for this is Scarlet Crusader and Harvest Golem. Harvest Golem is one of the best buff recipients in the entire game. Getting a Defender of Argus buff on a Harvest Golem is completely ridiculous. You get a 3-4 with Taunt that comes back as a 2-1. <laughs> Completely insane curving you got there. Lastly, we have two Void Walkers as being the best taunt one drop pretty much in the game. It's an offensive shield bearer. 
that's all that needs to be said really. Voidwalker is a very very good one drop. It's the reason why this kind of Warlock deck works is the fact that the Warlock one drops are very very powerful. You have Flame Imp, Voidwalker really holds the deck together. Anyway, thank you all for watching. If you like the content, please subscribe. If you have any feedback, put it in the comment section below. If you want to come chat to me, pop on TeamSpeak. I'll put the information to Mount and Grind's TeamSpeak in the description below. Anyway, as for now, this is Jotto, signing off.